All right, folks, so what we're doing here is measuring the occupied bandwidth of a transmitted frequency. This frequency is on the two meter band and is transmitted in FM analog. We're doing this on a tiny SA Ultra and we're using a feature called channel power. What we're going to do in this video is talk a little bit about what all this stuff means and then we're going to do a practical demonstration showing you how you can do this at home with your radios. So when we talk about occupied bandwidth, we talk about the amount of spectrum that it is required to transmit your signal. With uh, two meter and 70 centimeter FM analog mode, we use FM modulation. And what that means is that we transmit a carrier signal along with some encoded information that goes along with it. That encoded information is voice data. Typically you could do other stuff, but we, we do vo FM analogs, mostly voice. And what happens is, is that with frequency modulation or FM mode, your signal moves back and forth ever so slightly. And when it is demodulated on the other side, the amount of deviation is how it extracts that code and can hear your audible signal. With FM, we typically move around plus or minus five kilohertz. So that means that we have about plus or five minus kilohertz of deviation there. Plus we have a little bit of extra when we throw some voice or some noise or some sound on top of that. We want to make sure that our deviation is accurate and can be modulated correctly and demodulated so that we, ha we have a clear audio transmission that uh, folks can hear, prevents splatter, and is a clean signal all the way around. We can use a Tiny SA or the Tiny SA Ultra or the Tiny SA Ultra Plus. I think there's five different models of Tiny SA available now. All of them have the ability to do this. And uh, what we're going to do is we're really talking about this from an amateur radio perspective. The same holds true if you were measuring other types of signals like FRS, GMRS, citizen band, uh, or the like. So the first question really is, is what is frequency deviation? And we talked a little bit about that, but it's the amount that the signal moves back and forth. Now, when you see math formulas, and we're going to take a quick look at one, so don't get too excited. Um, it's the it's defined or displayed as the delta of squiggly F, and it just means the change in frequency when you modulate via FM. We talked about it being around 5 kilohertz plus or minus because it goes up and down the spectrum as we transmit. Now, the, now the human voice, <coughs> or actually our transmitted signal, any sound that we do there, it has something that's called a baseband audio. And that is around 300 hertz to around 3 kilohertz. That is just the amount of audio spectrum that we're modulating on top of that signal. So that means we need another 3K in our deviation calculation, right? So you get 5 plus 3 is 8, plus or minus 8 is 16. So what we like to see is something around 16 kilohertz wide. And that's what we're going to look to measure. We're actually going to look to measure 18 because you have uh, pre-emphasis and de-emphasis uh, sounds like when people pop their P's or T's, t -t -t -t, those sounds <clears throat> make a little bit more audio spectrum. They're a little higher pitched and they make your signal a little bit wider. So what we really look for is around 95% of our signal in around 18 kilohertz. That's really the, the measurement that we like to use there. Now, when we look at repeater frequencies, repeater frequencies are typically somewhere around 20 kilohertz apart. That means signals going to and from the repeaters have about 10 kilohertz on either side, making that channel, for lack of a better word, 20 kilohertz wide. So we want all of our signal to fit in there so we don't splatter over or bleed over onto other people when we're good citizens. So there's a guy, old man Carson, I don't know his first name, I don't know him personally, but he came up with a rule or a formula. If you take a look at it here in the bullets, what I have is, is that B equals bandwidth is equal to two times our frequency deviation plus any other max frequency that we're going to attach to that, uh, to that. And I covered in this case, we're going to look at 16 kilohertz wide when we do our measurement. In the real world, you do want to count a little bit for speech dynamics, and that's why we say around 18 to 20 kilohertz. Um, really, you want to be closer to 18 when you do these measurements. Um, there's an engineering implication here. So it says using Carson's rule to ensure compliance with spectral limits while maintaining intelligibility in voice transmissions. And that really means that when you build radios, you want to adhere to Carson's rule. And then you want to use that for transmitting and receiving. Now, when we use our tiny SA, and we're going to do a practical demonstration, and I'll show you this. Um, there's something called resolution bandwidth. And it, it's basically a little teeny window that moves along the spectrum as you do your sweep. And it looks for details in the audio signal. 
When you do this very wide, you have less data points and it can misrepresent your signal, make it look different than it really does. So in a lot of cases, we want to make a very small resolution bandwidth. Now, when you look at large pieces of spectrum with a tiny SA, you adjust your resolution bandwidth to be a little bit uh, bigger so the sweep doesn't take all day to complete. Because we're going to be measuring around 50 kilohertz, which really isn't a whole lot, we're going to look for a really small resolution bandwidth, typically somewhere in the 1 to 3 kilohertz range. For my measurements, I'm going to use 1 kilohertz because I can wait the extra 0.5 of a second for the sweep to complete, and it's not really too big of a deal to me. Again, if I was looking at large spectrum slices, like if I was doing a harmonic test, I would have a much larger uh, resolution bandwidth, probably somewhere around three to 600 kilohertz. But one to three is fine for taking a look at around 20 kilohertz channels. Um, the other thing is that you can use about 10 kilohertz for signal shape to see the shape of the signal. But because we want to make sure that we're getting an accurate measurement of how much of our transmitted energy is within a certain space, we're going to use something smaller. Always use protection, boys. So when we do this, we want to make sure that we use an attenuator when feeding any signal directly into our tiny SA. The tiny SA is rated for around 6 dB of power. Any more than that can damage the front end of your tiny SA, so we want to be really careful there. The other thing that we want to consider is that our tiny SA does its best work at around negative 25 dBm of input power. So we want to use enough attenuation to be around that level. Today we're going to use around 60 dB of attenuation, transmitting a 37 dB signal, 5 watts. That gives us around negative 23 dBm of input power, which should be more than adequate for this particular test. Um, we're going to make sure that our span is accurate. We're going to do spanning in 16 kilohertz. So I believe we're going to use somewhere around 52 kilohertz of spectrum, but my math's not good, so don't hold me to that. You can use things like peak um, detection by putting a marker on your audible peaks and stuff like that, but we really don't need to see that. Sometimes with your tiny SA, you'll set up averaging. So when you unkey or if there's fluctuations in your signal, it will hold those peaks a little bit longer. We're just going to keep the key down, so we should be fine. So the tiny SA doesn't have a dedicated OBW function for occupied bandwidth. So there's a couple of different things that we can do here. You can use manual measurement tools. So you can do a transmission of a sound. You can whistle into your microphone, whatever it is. And then you can place markers at different points, but this isn't really the most accurate way to do things. Uh, you can make a mistake. Maybe your whistle is in a constant uh, tone. So it's a problem, right? Um, the thing is, is that you can do this and you can make calculations in order to determine what your occupied bandwidth is. But there's something else that we can use, and that would be the channel power setting on the tiny SA. So there is a dedicated measurement for that, and it tells you basically the same thing. Occupied bandwidth says, hey, your signal takes up this much space. Channel power says, this is how much of your power is in this particular channel. So it shows you the same data, but it shows it to you differently. And that's what we're going to use in order to do this. Basically, we're going to go into the menu. We're going to go to measure. We're going to pick channel power. It's going to ask us for a transmission frequency. I do most of my tests on 14652. The reason I do this is because it's an easy frequency for me to remember, and it's the national calling frequency. You can do it on whatever frequency you want. And then we want to pick a channel width of 16 to 20 kilohertz wide. We're going to go with 16. I already covered that. One of the things that you can do is, is that once you do your test at 16, you can expand that to 18, 20, 25. And you take a look at your output power level, and you can see if it rises. So right, if it rises 1 dB from 16 to 18, that means you have about a half of a dB splatter on either side of your signal. So based on everything we just talked about, the four things that you need to remember for this particular test is use 1 to 3 kilohertz resolution bandwidth. You want to target 16, 18, 20 kilohertz channel spacing when you do this test. Um, use the channel power feature on your tiny SA, and then most importantly, avoid direct keying, meaning that you use a pad or an attenuator or something of that like that would make sure that your full power transmission is not, like you use a directional coupler, for example, to make sure that your full power is not going into your tiny SA and it survives to see another day. Okay, what I want to do here is I just want to show quickly how we set up for this particular test. So I have a tiny SA Ultra here, and I'm going to plug a USB cable in here to connect it to my computer. The reason I don't have it that way right now is because I want it to fit underneath the camera in an easy way. 
we have a radio. In this case, we're using just an HT. You can use whatever radio you want. It doesn't need to be an HT. You can do this test on any radio that transmit any frequency. And we're going to shoot that signal. We're going to squirt it out into what I call the big ass attenuator. This is a 100 watt attenuator that um, attenuates 40 dB. It's a great attenuator. I love it. Here we have a little bit of a cheaper attenuator, and it's just the itty bitty attenuator. This is 10 watts, 10 dB. In the event that you <clears throat> want to chain multiple attenuators together, you always want your most powerful one closest to your transmission source. That way you risk damaging your smaller attenuator. Then we have a short piece of coax jumper that comes here into the RF input on our tiny SA. All right, we have our tiny SA connected to the computer and it's right there. Let me do a little bit of setup on this thing and we'll get it working. All right, so the first thing I want to do is I want to come down to measure and I'm going to pick that. And then I am going to go to more and then I am going to pick channel power. It's asking me for my frequency of interest and it's 146.52 megahertz. And now what it's asking me for is my channel width. And we talked about doing this at 16 kilohertz. And that's what we picked. And what you can see here, let me get this thing all the way screwed in, is that our channel has now been divided into sections. You have one in the center, that's the transmission frequency, and then we have each adjacent channel to that, one before and one after in terms of spectrum. What I need to do is I need to right now account for our attenuators. So what I'm going to do is go into level and I'm going to hit external gain. I'm going to type in negative 50 because we have negative 50 dBm of external attenuation. Now we have a nice new screen here. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on, I'm going to hit this attenuate option and I'm going to set manual. I'm going to turn on my internal attenuator. And now we're going to leave that at 10 dB. The reason we're doing that is tiny SA likes using its internal attenuator. 10 dB gives us 60 dB of attenuation, takes our overall transmitted signal down to negative 23. And we talked about the tiny SA performs best at around negative 25 dBm. So that's right where we want to be. Let's see what happens when we key up. You can see that sweep is going across the bottom and it's taking its time. And there is our transmitted signal and it's showing hundred percent in there, but that signal looks a little narrow. So I'm going to use a DTM MF. I'm going to use a TTMF tone and we're going to let this sweep one more time. And you can see how granular that is with all those little spikes in there. Now, one of the things that we did not do is we didn't change our resolution bandwidth. I didn't do that because I wanted to show you a 200 hertz, which is very low. What I talked about doing before, let me go back. And let me go back. And under frequency, we have a resolution bandwidth setting. Let me go ahead and set that to 1 kilohertz. So that's where I like to do this measurement. And now you can see at the bottom, that green line going across is moving a little bit faster than last time when well, we're keying up and we get our signal acquisition. Now I'm going to use a DTMF tone. And then you can see that it's a little less prickly because we have less, less granular measurements there. But again, hundred percent of our signal is with inside that channel. So this radio is performing very well. Let's go back in our resolution bandwidth and let's say that we do something like measure at 10 kilohertz. And you can see that we just have a flat line. And did I pick 10 kilohertz? No, I picked 100 kilohertz. 100 kilohertz is so wide, it's just staying flat, right? So it's not a valid measurement. Let's go back in here, let's take a look at resolution bandwidth and make sure we pick 10 kilohertz the right way. So now we pick 10 kilohertz, let's key up. And this is without the DTMF tone. That's with the DTMF tone. But what you can see is when we do this, it says only 94% of our signal fits into that space, into our channel. And that's not accurate. That is because our tiny SA is configured incorrectly and our data points are too far apart to get an accurate representation of the signal. And that's why it's important to make sure you do that correctly. Now you know how to do this and you can go measure all your devices. 
that's going to wrap up this video. So I'm going to say thank you for watching, everyone. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or recommendations, go ahead and post them below, and I'll do my best to respond.